The First Amendment to the United States Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. <laughs> Lao Tzu said, those who know do not speak. Those who speak do not know. Sticks and stones will break your bones, my mother said, but names will never hurt you. My bones, I said. In the beginning was the word, John said, and the word was with God and the word was God. We know little that is certain about words, Virginia Woolf said, but this we do know. Words never make anything that is useful. And words are the only things that tell the truth and nothing but the truth. The pen is mightier than the sword, Edward Bulwer Lighton said. Love me tender, Elvis said. <laughs> love me sweet. You don't know what love is, Billie Holiday said. Elvis was a hero to most, Chuck D said but he never meant shit to me. <laughs> you see, straight up racist the sucker was, simple and plain. And Flavor Flav said, motherfuck him and John Wayne. <laughs> and Samuel Johnson said, patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. And Bob Dylan said, patriotism is the last refuge to which a scoundrel clings. Steal a little and they'll throw you in jail. Steal a lot and they'll make you king. Your silence will not protect you, Audre Lorde said. Our language is the reflection of ourselves, Cesar Chavez said. A language is an exact reflection of the character and growth of its speakers. A rat done bit my sister Nell, Gil Scott Heron said. With Whitey on the moon, her face and arms began to swell, and Whitey's on the moon. Our songs travel the earth, Louise Erdrich said. We sing to one another. Not a single note is ever lost, and no song is original. They all come from the same place and go back to a time when only the stones howled. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, Macbeth said creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Fire! Someone shouted in a crowded theater. Father, forgive them, Jesus said, for they know not what they do. I'm not afraid of the pen, or the scaffold, or the sword, said Mother Jones. I will tell the truth wherever I please. I have a dream. Martin Luther King Jr. said that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. And Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And Egret said, you know nothing, Jon Snow. <laughs> we hold these truths to be self-evident, the Declaration of Independence says, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers 
from the consent of the governed. Would you please, 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 please stop talking, Jig said to the American. Lying is done with words, Adrian Rich said, and also with silence. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Writers Resist Seattle. We're here tonight to celebrate free speech. <laughs> and to exercise our right to free speech and to bring to life some of the powerful speech of previous writers regarding the American ideals of freedom and equality. There are almost 100 Writers Resist readings happening around the world and around the country tonight, and nine of them are in Washington State. <laughs> what we resist tonight in Seattle is despair, and what we resist tonight in Seattle is silence. 14 readers have prepared brief readings, and Doug Honig from the ACLU is going to tell us a little bit about speech and his organization's mission. The ACLU has four tables in this hall, staffed by people who would love to talk with you further and help you support them if you should want to do that. After the reading, we hope you'll join us at the bar where we can further exercise our right to speech and our right to have a beer. Again, welcome and thank you for coming. Whoa. Now I'd like to introduce my co-organizer for tonight's event, Kristen Miaris Young. What did Dr. King teach us? We, you, I, all of us together have the power and the responsibility to focus our attention and those, that of those around us on the ideals of a just and compassionate society. We as writers are here to inspire you to believe in the future of our democracy. You are that future. And the times are such it may come a time not too long from now when people ask you, what did you do? I want you to think about answering that question tonight, inspired by what you're about to hear. Please welcome Doug Honig of the ACLU of Washington. Thank you very much. Um, let's start out by acknowledging that these are daunting times. But at the same time, I'm very excited to see so many people here tonight because it shows what we've been seeing at the ACLU, that there are a lot of people who still believe in America's values and want to do something about it. Now, this isn't the first time we've faced dawning challenges. Let's, let's really keep that in mind. The ACLU was founded in 1920 by a small number of people at a time when there were very little protection for freedom of speech. People who had views critical of the government were routinely arrested, prosecuted, and jailed. Non-citizens who had radical viewpoints were simply rounded up and deported. Since then, we've seen the internment of Japanese Americans in the 1940s, McCarthyism in the late 40s and 1950s, attempts to repress dissent in the 1960s, dissent by people opposed to the war in Vietnam, dissent by people involved in the civil rights movement. In the 1980s, we saw widespread discrimination against the LGBT community during the AIDS epidemic. And of course, after 9-11, we saw profiling of Arabs and Muslims, great large-scale surveillance programs, including the notorious United Strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act, something that was such a mouthful that it was guaranteed to be referred to by its acronym, the USA Patriot Act, which immediately brings to mind, if you have objections to it, let's talk about your patriotism. Now, we've gotten through all these times. Yes, there were lives that were seriously harmed. There was harm done to America's values. But all of these challenges seemed incredibly daunting, and we're still held today with a Bill of Rights and with the First Amendment. Now we have a new set of challenges, and past success 
in getting through challenges doesn't predict anything. In some ways, the challenges are unique. You know, you've been watching the news just like I have. But in some ways, they're old. There's a dictum at the ACLU, no fight for civil liberties stays won. And what that means is issues keep coming up over and over again. And just because you've won something doesn't mean it's going to stay won unless you're ready to keep fighting. Um, and there's certainly going to be widespread pushback against people exercising their freedom of speech, our freedom of speech, to criticize the upcoming administration. We're already seeing some of that here in Washington State. You may have read about it. It was a bill proposed this fall and is going to be before the legislature to treat nonviolent civil disobedience as economic terrorism, the notion being that it's breaking the law, that it interferes with business, and it's coercive. Well, the ACLU was very quick to point out that the courageous people who sat in at lunch counters in the South during the Civil Rights Movement in order to bring about desegregation were interfering with business. The business owners experienced it as coercive. Today, what do we think about that? We think they're national heroes, not terrorists. We don't need this law. Now, in terms of fighting back, that's where freedom of speech comes in. It's a tool to combat oppressive measures. It's everybody's right. And the ACLU has another little epigram, freedom can't defend itself. That means it's up to us to exercise our freedoms, defend our freedoms, or they just end up being words on a document to be trotted out at ceremonial occasions, to be taught our young people in schools, but not to have real meaning. It's really about people standing up together and coming to events like this and doing things beyond it that is needed to challenge what we're gonna be facing. Now, one of the beauties is that freedom of speech comes in so many different forms. There are letters to the editor, flyers, bumper sticker, blobs, Facebook posts, large demonstrations, medium demonstrations, small demonstrations. Now, when people ask me at, at the ACLU, what should I do? I say, find an issue or set of issues that resonates with you, find your voice, and, and work on it, and speak out, and join other people working on it. Now, at the ACLU, we have some resources to help you. At least I had them here. Ah. Oh, uh, there they are. <laughs> Rights sometimes get lost, but you have to be willing to retrieve them. <laughs> One of them is what we affectionately call our bust card. It's wallet sized, it's your rights in encounters with the police. Uh, another one that we, oh, and we just printed it in Arabic. Yeah. Another one that's very new is a pocket-sized Bill of Rights. Now, how do we fit it in this? We made it in plain speak. We edited the language a little bit so it becomes the way people talk now rather than way back when. Uh, coming up soon is a wallet-sized card on your rights to free speech and protest. If you want to know more about that, go to the ACLU of Washington website, aclu-wa.org, and look for uh, Protest, a Guide to Free Speech Rights in Washington. And there's a lot more about it there. We also are exercising our free speech uh, relating to the upcoming administration with a bumper sticker. You probably can't read it, so I'll read it for you. No one trumps the Constitution. And, the, um, and copies of all these are on our table with our wonderful volunteers out in the hall. Um, the other thing we've been doing is we've started giving workshops to interested groups on free speech rights. The first couple we've done were for a group some of you may have heard of called Pantsuit Nation. Yeah. 
And these are a bunch of fired up people, mostly women, but not exclusively. And they're really an example of what we need these days, people who are willing to stand up and do things. And what was most exciting to me, started out the trainings by going around the room, uh, asking people why they were there, and found out that a lot of people had not been politically active for a long time, or forever. And, and that's what we're seeing, literally people coming out of the woodworks wanting to do something. Now finally, I take some heart uh, for the situation and the challenges we're facing when I look at the history of the ACLU. As I said, it was founded in 1920, small group of people back on the East Coast in New York had no notion or vision that it would grow to become a nationwide organization with staffed offices and large numbers of members in virtually every state in the union. Uh, that it would grow in, by 2016 to have a half million members uh, and 18,000 here in Washington. Oh, but wait a second, that was just as of election day. In the two months since then, we've gotten 14,500 new members here in Washington. Yeah. I think nationally it's either uh, three quarters of a million or 800,000. We've gotten 400 new people offering to volunteer for us, 5,000 more Facebook fans, near and dear to my heart, and et, et cetera, et cetera. And this is coming from two things, both it's people who share anxiety and fear, but it's also people who want to do something and support organizations which they think are important, and I encourage anybody who's not an ACLU member to think of joining. Uh, contrary to a big myth, it's not a lawyer's organization. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm my best friends, but uh, anybody can join, and also to support the many other organizations that may resonate with you, like Planned Parenthood, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, on and on, that are gonna be fighting back against what kind of policies will come from the Trump administration. Now I have one final word for all of us. Onward. Our next reader is Seattle's Youth Poet Laureate, Angel Gardner. Hello. Um, I'm going to be reading two of my own pieces. Um, the first one's called Nicknames. <clears throat> they were always trying to brand me, but each name was wrong. Bitter as it glided past their tonsils, burning as it reached their eyes framed with crow's feet. My name would always sour. Junior mint, juicy, egg roll, angle. Nothing ever soaked into their tongues. Nicknames only set atop it. 24 hours later, it fermented. Angel Dust, Angel Lou. Lost. She's lost. If we name her, we can keep her. Bitch, blunt, damaged, survivor. Palm prints pickled my skin where the nicknames were pushed in. I can still see them because the edges refuse to blend. My name is cheap thrill and dirty canvas. Everyone wanted to wipe their shame over me, but don't think for a second that they'd turn back now even to throw their own shit in my direction. My name was late night sex scene. Hands breaking innocence over my backside and sending it rippling over my bed sheets. My name is still lodged behind someone's teeth. I hid it away when I told them I was fine because we'd gone too far and I didn't want it to matter that they'd hurt me. What better way to disconnect than to temporarily strip yourself of your own identity? My name was nothing special until everyone figured out compassion was all they really needed to get an in with me. They only needed to kneel down to my emotional level. Everyone loves a challenge, and this one was get to know the demisexual. My name at one point was only found between thighs and beside pulsing belly buttons. My name was trapped between my palm and hers. She thought it was love while I wondered which one of us would fall apart first. It was never smart to mix manic depression with bipolar disorder. My name is my own, yet it remains unclaimed, sitting in the base of my throat and scratching at the marrow in my bones. I'm not yet myself, but I don't really want to change. I am who I'll become, and even then, I'll still be Angel. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, and this next and final one is called A Few Words to America. <clears throat> we have been tainted, and now we've been blamed for it. My black did not bleed into your white. Your white dove head first into my ancestors' melanin. We have been tainted. Fuck make America great again. Let's make America honest for once. <laughs> no more go back to your country bullshit. We know damn well that whole continent has been whipped, lynched, and shipped. Our home will be wherever the hell we make it. We are sun-favored, kinky-haired, pains, and privileged asses. We are locked elbows, entangled roots of family trees, littered with softly swaying strange fruit. Cinder blocks line our backbones, and iron coats the bottoms of our feet. We're black, of color. You can hang that sign that reads, no Negroes from the chip on your shoulder, if you feel the need, and I'll make sure it's not dusty as I walk my black ass on by. Life has proven too short to, be to avoid being risky. I am risky. We are risky. America fears minority, but I am minority from the balls of my feet to the stubborn clinch in my teeth. America, put your star-spangled shackles to my ankles and call me ignorant when I can't find a way to run from what's hunting me. Tear the djembe from my hip, set fire to the kente cloth outlining my lineage. Beat my body and downplay my determination, but I am made up from strength, love, and the black of my ancestors. America will not change me. Thank you. Our next reader is Washington State Poet Laureate Todd Marshall. I'm gonna talk a little bit about visions. The second coming. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood dim tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. The Second Coming by William Butler Yeats was written right at the end of the First World War. 17 million people had died, and the seeds of the Second World War were planted in the fertile soil of fear and resentment that took hold of many. In 2017, the monstrous image at the end, that rough beast whose hour has come round at last, is not the most horrific image in the poem. I believe that the truly horrific part of Yeats's work is found earlier when he writes, quote, the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. We are gathered tonight as people who value words people who value creativity. Perhaps nothing is more important for agape, that selfless love of which Martin Luther King often spoke, than creativity, because it allows us to imagine, to empathize, and to love one another, not in spite of our differences, but because of them, as we realize resplendence and plurality. Look around you. This is fantastic, so many people here. We're here tonight because we know that creativity makes life compelling. I memorize language that matters to me because I want the freedom to decide what words are in my heart, and because I know that if I don't claim that space inside of me, others surely will. We're here because we believe in the connection between creativity and love. I think of the end of Toni Morrison's novel, Song of Solomon, where an important character, 
a woman who has lived outside of the boundaries of society, who has been discriminated against because of her race, gender, and sexuality, sacrifices herself, takes a bullet for her beloved nephew, and whispers to him before she dies, I wished I'd have known more people. I would have loved them all. If I'd have known more, I would have loved more. I value these words, carry them with me in my heart, because they are the best sort of words, generous and giving. They are con the convictions of a visionary. And that word vision is the word I'd like to end with. In 1963, James Baldwin wrote, quote, I don't think anyone can doubt that in this country today, we are menaced, intolerably menaced, by a lack of vision. And where there is no vision, people perish. Baldwin adds, quote, it is inconceivable that a sovereign people should continue, as we do so abjectly, to say, I can't do anything about it. It's the government. The government is the creation of the people. It is responsible to the people, and the people are responsible for it. No American has the right to allow the present government to say, when Negro children are being bombed and hosed and shot and beaten all over the Deep South, that there is nothing we can do about it. To which Baldwin also adds, quote, it is your responsibility to change society if you think of yourself as an educated person. And on the basis of the evidence, the moral and political evidence, one is compelled to say that this is a backward society. The blood dim tide, the backward society, the rough beast. No matter how grim this moment might seem, we have to believe in the importance of words that matter, words like those of Toni Morrison's that can bring us to love more people, words that give us conviction worth acting upon. Thomas Akempis wrote in the 15th century, whoever loves much does much, does much. Look around at all these people here tonight who I think want to do a lot. I think that all of you feel, as I feel, that the strength in this room can give us strength going forward, and we will need that strength because there is, this is a time in which we cannot lack conviction as Martin Luther King, James Baldwin, and Toni Morrison remind us, there is much work to be done. Next is Seattle's, Seattle's civic poet, Claudia Castro Luna. Ain't I a Woman, speech delivered by Sojourner Truth at the 1851 Women's Convention in Akron, Ohio. Well, children, where there is so much racket, there must be something out of kilter. I think that twixt the Negroes of the South and the women at the North, all talking about rights, the white man will be in a fix pretty soon. But what's all this here talking about? That man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place. And ain't I a woman? Look at me. Look at my arm. I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns, and no man could heed me, and ain't I a woman. I could work as much and eat as much as, I man, as a man when I could get it, and bear the lash as well, and ain't I a woman. I have borne 13 children and seen most old sold to slavery, and when I cried out with my mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me, and ain't I a woman? Then they talk about this thing in the head. What is it they call it? Intellect. That's it, honey. What's that got to do with women's rights or Negroes' rights? If my cup won't hold but a pint, and yours holds a quart, wouldn't you be mean not to let me have my little half measure full? Then that little man in black there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? 
Where did your Christ come from? From God and the woman. Man had nothing to do with him. <laughs> if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn it back and get it right side up again. And now they is asking to do it. The man better let them. Obliged to you for hearing me, and now old Sojourner ain't got nothing more to say. But I, Claudia Castro Luna, have a few things to say. <laughs> there is a man over there soon to occupy the highest office in the land who says immigrants are rapists, criminals, the worst kind of people. I have never committed a crime, have paid taxes every year of my adult life, have worked to earn an honest wage, and am I not an immigrant? He says immigrants take away from everyone, and for this they should be rounded up by the millions and deported. They should be banned and blacklisted for worshiping in a way that differs from his. I studied hard to obtain an education and work to educate children in public schools and every day commit to lead a life worthy of my parents' sacrifice, who knew this country was by no means perfect, but it offered us, offered us refuge and hope. And am I not an immigrant? That man over there may well say, you are an exception, but let me tell you, all of us in my immigrant family, my immigrant friends, and the many immigrant brothers and sisters, none of us lead our lives to cheat, deceit, take advantage of anyone or any system. We love our kin like everyone else and aspire to a fulfilled life. The immigrants I know are nurses, teachers, doctors, day laborers, professors. They own businesses, clean school buildings, compose music, make sculptures, write poems, and all are dreamers. From its dawning, where did the majority of this country's population come from? Where did it come from? From other places, other countries. The exceptionalism of this country resides in that very fact, in the respect and wonderment of difference. Let her, let her who can produce a birth certificate immune to the waves of immigration to this country speak to the grandeur of this land before it was bound to Western laws. Otherwise, the road has been, is made by walking together, juntos, together, todos juntos, todos juntos. Thank you for listening. David Laskin. I'm going to read three passages. The first is from The Case for Reparations by ta Coates. The wealth accorded America by slavery was not just in what the slaves pulled from the land, but in the slaves themselves. In 1860, slaves as an asset were worth more than all of America's manufacturing. All of the railroads, all of the productive capacity of the United States put together. Yale historian David W. Blight has noted, slaves were the single largest by far financial asset of property in the entire American economy. The vending of the black body and the sundering of the black family became an economy unto themselves, estimated to have brought in tens of millions of dollars to antebellum America. In a time when telecommunications were primitive and blacks lacked freedom of movement, the parting of black families was a kind of murder. Here we find the roots of American wealth and democracy, and in the for-profit destruction of the most important asset 
available to any people, the family. The destruction was not incidental to America's rise, it facilitated that rise. By erecting a slave society, America created the economic foundation for its great experiment in democracy. The second passage is from the autobiography of Malcolm X. Human history's greatest crime was the traffic in black flesh. When the devil white man went into Africa and murdered and kidnapped to bring to the West in chains, in slave ships, millions of black men, women, and children who were worked and beaten and tortured as slaves. The devil white man cut these black people off from all knowledge of their own kind and cut them off from any knowledge of their own language, religion, and past culture until the black man in America was the Earth's only race of people who had absolutely no knowledge of his true identity. In one generation, the black slave women in America had been raped by the slave master white man until there had begun to emerge a homemade, handmade, brainwashed race that was no longer even of its true color, that no longer even knew its true family names. The slave master forced his family name upon this rape mixed race, which the slave master began to call the Negro. The slave master injected his Christian religion into this Negro. This Negro was taught to worship an alien god, having the same blonde hair, pale skin, and blue eyes as the slave master. This religion taught the Negro that black was a curse. It taught him to hate everything black, including himself. It taught him that everything white was good, to be admired, respected, and loved. It brainwashed this Negro to think he was superior if his complexion showed more of the white pollution of the slave master. This white man's Christian religion further deceived and brainwashed this Negro to always turn the other cheek and grin and scrape and bow and be humble and to sing and to pray and to take whatever was dished out by the devilish white man and to look for his pie in the sky and for his heaven in the hereafter while right here on earth, the slave master white man enjoyed his heaven. 400 years of black blood and sweat invested here in America and the white man still has the black man begging for what every immigrant fresh off the ship can take for granted the minute he walks down the gangplank. Many a time I have looked back trying to assess just for myself my first reactions to all this. Every instinct of the ghetto jungle streets, every hustling fox and criminal wolf instinct in me, which would have scoffed at and rejected anything else, was struck numb. It was as though all of that life merely was back there without any remaining effect or influence. I remember how sometime later, reading the Bible in the Norfolk Prison Colony Library, I came upon, then I read over and over, how Paul on the road to Damascus, upon hearing the voice, voice of Christ, was so smitten that he was knocked off his horse in a daze. I do not now, and I did not then liken myself to Paul, but I do understand his experience. And the final passage is from Survival in Auschwitz by Primo Levi. Even in this place, one can survive, and therefore one must want to survive, to tell the story, to bear witness, and that to survive, we must force ourselves to save at least the skeleton the scaffolding, the form of civilization. We are slaves, deprived of every right, exposed to every insult, condemned to certain death. But we still possess one power, and we must defend it with all our strength, for it is the last, the power to refuse our consent.
Imani Sims can't be with us tonight due to illness, so our next reader, therefore, is Bruce Barkhart. Well, I enjoyed uh, 15 hours of the Jeff Sessions hearings last week. It's part of my job. Um, and the issue of voting rights came up quite a bit, which led me back to um, uh, a book called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. Fantastic book. It is the silent spring of the current social justice movement. It profoundly changed my life. Um, it's not poetry. It's not an inspiring essay. It is just hard truths, facts told plainly, and sometimes free speech is as simple as saying and writing what you see. This is from the new Jim Crow. Jarvis Cotton cannot vote. Like his father and generations before him, he has been denied the right to participate in our democracy. Cotton's great-great-grandfather couldn't vote as a slave. His great-grandfather was beaten to death by the Klan for attempting to vote. The Klan intimidated his grandfather from voting. His father was barred by poll taxes and literacy tests. Today, Jarvis Cotton cannot vote because he, like many black men in America, has been labeled a felon. In each generation, new tactics have been used for achieving the same goal, denying African Americans citizenship. An extraordinary percentage of black men in the US today are legally barred from voting, just as they have been throughout most of American history. They are also subject to legalized discrimination in employment, housing, education, public benefits, and jury service. What has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the structure of our society than with the language we use to justify it. In the era of colorblindness, it's no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination and social contempt. So we don't. Instead, we use our justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices we supposedly left behind. Today, it's perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways that it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. As a criminal, you have scarcely more rights than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. <clears throat> I reached this conclusion, this is Michelle Alexander, I reached this conclusion reluctantly. Ten years ago, I was rushing to catch a bus when I noticed a poster that caught my eye. It was a sign stapled to a telephone pole that screamed in bold print, the drug war is the new Jim Crow. Some radical group was holding a community meeting about the expansion of America's prison system. I sighed and mothered to myself something like, yeah, the justice system is racist in many ways, but it, it, it doesn't help to make such an absurd comparison. People will just think you're crazy. I hopped the bus and headed to my new job as director of the Racial Justice Project of the ACLU in Northern California. <laughs> A few years later, when I left the ACLU, I had come to suspect that I was wrong about the justice system. The activists who posted the sign on the telephone pole were not crazy. I came to see that mass incarceration in the US had, in fact, emerged as a comprehensive and well-disguised system of racialized social control that functions in a manner strikingly similar to Jim Crow. And a little later in the book, um, Michelle Alexander talks about what she found in terms of um, voting rights and how those are taken from people even after they serve their time. 48 states prohibit inmates from voting while incarcerated. Only Maine and Vermont permit inmates to vote. Even after the term of punishment expires, some states deny the right to vote for a period ranging from a number of years to the rest of one's life. This is not the norm. In those few European countries that permit limited post-prison disqualification, the number of people disenfranchised is in the hundreds. In the United States, the number is in the millions. Even those who are technically eligible to vote frequently remain disenfranchised for life. The restoration process is a bureaucratic maze that requires the payment of fines or court costs. These bureaucratic minefields are the modern day equivalent of poll taxes and literacy tests, rules designed to make voting a practical impossibility. 
leave this section um, by quoting a um, man she met as part of her research. His name was Clinton Drake, a 55-year-old African-American man in Alabama who was arrested in 1988 for possession of marijuana. Five years later, he was arrested again, this time for having about $10 worth of pot on him. Facing between 10 and 20 years in prison, Drake, a Vietnam veteran, and at the time a cook, at a, a cook on a local Air Force base, took his public defender's advice and accepted a plea bargain. Under the agreement, he would only have to spend five years behind bars. Five years for five joints. This is, this is not, not unusual in the, in the South, even today. Once released, Drake found he was forbidden by law from voting until he paid $900 in court costs, an impossible task given that he was now unemployed and the low-wage jobs he might conceivably find would not allow him to accumulate $900 in savings. For all practical purposes, he would never vote again. And she quotes, uh, she quotes Clinton Drake who says, I put, my life on, I put my life on the line for this country. To me, not voting is not right. My youngest son, right now he's in Iraq. My oldest son, he fought in the first Persian Gulf conflict. But I'm not able to vote. They say I owe $900 in fines. To me, that's a poll tax. You gotta pay to vote. It's restitution, they say. I know a lot of friends got the same cases like I got, not able to vote. A lot of guys doing the same things I was doing, just marijuana. They treat it like, in Alabama, like you committed treason or something. I was on the 1965 voting rights march from Selma. I was 15 years old. At 18, I was in Vietnam fighting for my country. And now they won't allow me to vote. That's Michelle, Michelle Alexander from The New Jim Crow. This is from me. Say what you see, write it, shout it, do what you can, where you are. Thank you. Our next reader is Kristen Biares Young. We must rise beyond the failings of the origins of our democracy. Who will do that work? There has been a long time in my life when I felt that my contributions to the furtherment the betterment of our society into furthering the ideals that we believe in will come purely through my profession as a journalist. And then I thought that I would influence people by helping them understand each other as a novelist. And now I wonder, I know, that neither of those things will be enough, that I must do more. And so I'm going to read from the inaugural poem by Elizabeth Alexander. She first delivered this on January 20th, 2009, called Praise Song for the Day. It was collected in Crave Radiance on Grey Wolf Press. And I think you will hear in her language the legacy of Dr. King, who continues with his example to challenge us to this day to give more, to give now, to keep caring when caring is hard, when caring brings you back into a trauma that one would rather escape. We must return to the site of our origins in democracy and bring it to the level of insight and knowledge that hearing all of our voices together tonight and in the many generations that have come before can help us reach. We must. There is no one else who will do this work for us. Now from Elizabeth Alexander. Say it plain. Many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here, who laid the tracks, raised the bridges, picked the cotton and the lettuce, built brick by brick the glittering edifices they would then keep clean and work inside of. Praise song for struggle. Praise song on this day. Praise song for every hand-lettered sign, the figuring it out on kitchen tables. Some live by love thy neighbor as thyself, others by first do no harm, or take no more than you need. What if the mightiest word is love, love that casts a widening pool of light, love that has no need to preempt grievance? 
today, anything can be made, any sentence begun. Praise song for walking forward in that light. Thank you. Please welcome Sam Ligon to the stage. Got two short pieces. The first one is the Gettysburg Address by uh, Abraham Lincoln. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work, which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. You know, I think a big part of um, resistance is in play and is in laughing and not allowing uh, idiocy to not be called out and made fun of and mocked mercilessly. <laughs> um, so against Lincoln's, the weight of Lincoln, I'm reading a poem by Jill McDonough called Dear Gay Bashers. The night we got bashed, we told Rusty how they drove up, yelled, queer, threw a hot dog, sped off. Rusty said, now, is that gay bashing or are they just calling you queer? Good point. Josie pitied the fools. Who buys a perfectly good pack of wieners and drives around San Francisco chucking them at gays? <laughs> and who speeds off, missing the point, the pleasure of the bash? Dear bashers, you should have seen the hot dog hit my neck. The scarf Josie sewed from antique silk kimonos, so gay. You missed laughing at us, us confused. You're a hot dog on the ground. Josie and Rusty and Bob make fun of the gay bashers, and I wash my scarf in the sink. I use wool light. We worry about insurance, interest rates, not hot dogs thrown from F-150s, homophobic freaks. <laughs> After the bashing, we use the ATM in the sex shop next to Annie's social club, smiled at the kind owner, his handlebar mustache. Astrid Gilberto sang, tall and lean and young and lovely, the girl from Ipanina, and the dildos gleamed from the walls. A hundred cheerful colors. <laughs> In San Francisco, it rains hot dogs. <laughs> Pity the fool. Ass-sized penguins, cock after cock in azure acrylic, butterscotch glass, 
anyone's flesh tone. Chrome. Our next reader is Jane Wong. I have to be honest with you all. I'm angry <laughs> and I'm afraid. And when I'm angry and when I'm afraid, I write poems and I read Lucille Clifton. So I'll start with a poem of mine and end with Clifton. How to not be afraid of everything. How to not punch everyone in the face. How to not protect everyone's eyes from my own punch. I have been practicing my punch for years, loosening my limbs. My jaw unhinged creates a felony I refuse to go to court for. The spat of spam pools in the sun reminding me of my true feelings. My feelings leak from my ear like a bad cold in a bad storm. Stars huddle in a corner, little radiators sweating out their fear. A possum reaches his arm up from a porch. I hold onto his arm for a little while, for a little warmth. At night, my subterranean eye begins to rove. Song of the underground, song of the rat tribe. I see my mother in an apron splattered with viscera I will eat for dinner to gut her work out, to work her guts out. Can we talk about privilege? Can I say I always look behind me? I always look behind me. I always take a step forward like I'm about to save myself from toppling over. I'm about to save myself from toppling over now. The bare bones of it. Some of us know that spoiled meat still counts as protein that a horse's neck snaps from the weight of what it carries, from the weight of what we give it to carry. I bundle up a sack of clouds, empty of rain and fear and lightning. And when I don't want to be angry and I don't want to be afraid because I am too tired to do both of those things, I read Lucille Clifton, um, and I'm wearing sequins for a reason tonight. This poem by Clifton is called, Won't You Celebrate With Me? Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model, born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other hand. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Thank you. The next reader is Robert Lashley. I celebrate the gorgeous mosaic in American literature, partly because I'm a writer and an artist and I don't, and there's, there's stuff there, and partly because um, uh, my grandparents and my um, aunts and uncles pay too much, too much rent in this motherfucker. <laughs> Today, I'm going to read um, Walt Whitman's, one of his um, later, uh, shorter pieces from Leaves of Grass. Um, I love the fact that, you know, Walt Whitman had, um, you know, his, his, he had an eye an understanding of folklore and folk and, and black folk traditions, and this was his way of of interspersing of interspersing that. Um, you know, some folks called it the spirits; he called it iodons. 
So I'm going to read Uncle Walter and I don't. I'm a seer, passing the hues and objects of the world, the fields of art and learning, pleasure, sense, to glean iodons. Put in thy chance, said he, no more the puzzling hour, no day, nor segments parts put in. Put the first before the rest as light for all and entrance song of all, that of iodons. Ever the dim beginning, ever the growth, the rounding of the circle, ever the summit and the merge at last to surely start again. Iodons, iodons, ever the mutable, ever materials changing, crumbling, recohering, ever the atliers, the factories divine, issuing iodons. Lo, I or you or woman, man or state, known or unknown, we seeming solid wealth, strength, beauty, build, but really build iodons. The austin evanescent, the substance of an artist's mood or seven studies long, or warriors, martyrs, heroes, toils to fashion iodons. Of every human life, the units gathered, posted, not a thought, emotion, deed left out, the whole or large, small, summed up, added up in its iodons. The old, old urge, based on ancient pinnacles, low, newer, higher pinnacles, from science and the modern still impelled, the old, old urge, iodons. The present now and here, America's busy, teeming, intricate world of aggregate and segregate for only that's releasing today's iodons. These with the past, of vanished lands, of the reigns of kings across seas, of conquerors, old campaigns, old sandals, voyages, joining iodons. Densities, growths, facades, strata of mountains, soils, rocks, giant trees, far born, far dying, living long, to leave iodons everlasting. Exhale, wrapped, ecstatic. The visible but their womb of birth, of orbic tendencies to shape and shape and shape the mighty earth iodon. All space, all time, the stars, the terrible perturbations of the sun, the swelling, collapsing, ending, serving their longer, shorter use, filled with iodons only. The noiseless myriads, the infinite oceans where rivers, rivers empty, the separate, countless free identities like eyesight, the true realities, iodons. Not this the world, nor these the universes, they the universes, purport and end, ever the permanent life of life, iodons, iodons. Beyond thy lectures learn, professor, Beyond thy telescope or spectroscope, observe a king, be observe a keen, beyond all mathematics, beyond the doctor's surgery, anatomy, beyond the chemist with his chemistry, the entity of entities, iodons, unfixed yet fixed, ever shall be, ever have been, and are, sweeping the present to the infinite future, iodons, iodons, iodons. The prophet and the bard shall yet maintain themselves in higher stages yet, shall meditate the, the modern to democracy, to interpret yet to them I, God and iodons. And thee, my soul, joys, ceaseless exercises, exaltations, thy, yam, thy yearning amply fed at last, prepared to meet thy mates, iodons, the body permanent, the body lurking there within the body, the only part of form through art, the real I myself, an image, an iodon, the very song not in thy songs, no special trains, no special tr strains to sing, none for itself, but from the whole resulting, rising at last and floating, a full round orbed iodon. Thank you. Next is Alyssa Washuda. In the Declaration of Independence, the indigenous people of this land are referred to 
as merciless Indian savages. Our lands have been stolen and occupied. Our spiritual practices have been suppressed. The speaking of our languages has been banned among children forced to attend government-run boarding schools. The continuance of our cultures has been achieved through resistance to federal policies meant to extinguish us. I'm going to read three poems now by Muscogee poet Joy Harjo. I am a dangerous woman. The sharp ridges of clear blue windows motion to me from the airport's second floor. Edges dance in the foothills of the sandias behind security guards who wave me into their gun catcher machine. I am a dangerous woman. When the machine buzzes, they say to take off my belt, and I remove it so easy that it catches the glance of a man standing nearby. Maybe that is the, de that the deadly weapon that has the machine singing. I am a dangerous woman, but the weapon is not visible. Security will never find it. They can't hear the clicking of the gun inside my head. For Alva Benson and for those who have learned to speak. And the ground spoke when she was born. Her mother heard it. In Navajo, she answered as she squatted down against the earth to give birth. It was now when it happened, now giving birth to itself again and again between the legs of women. Or maybe it was the Indian hospital in Gallup. The ground still spoke beneath mortar and concrete. She strained against the metal stirrups and they tied her hands down because she still spoke with them when they muffled her screams. But her body went on talking, and the child was born into their hands, and the child learned to speak both voices. She grew up talking in Navajo, in English, and watched the earth around her shift and change with the people in the towns and in the cities, learning not to hear the ground as it spun around beneath them. She learned to speak for the ground, the voice coming through her like roots that have long hungered for water. Her own daughter was born, like she had been, in either place or all places, so she could leave, leap into the sound she had always heard, a voice like water, like the gods weaving against sundown in a scarlet light. The child now hears names in her sleep. They change into other names and into others. It is the ground murmuring and Mount St. Helens erupts as the harmonic motion of a child turning inside her mother's belly, waiting to be born to begin another time. And we go on, keep giving birth and watch ourselves die over and over. And the ground spinning beneath us goes on talking. Fire. A woman can't survive by her own breath alone. She must know the voices of mountains. She must recognize the foreverness of blue sky. She must flow with the elusive bodies of night winds who will take her into herself. Look at me. I am not a separate woman. I am the continuance of blue sky. I am the throat of the mountains, a night wind who burns with every breath she takes. Next is Jess Walter. Thank you. Uh, when I told a, an old newspaper colleague of mine that I was doing an event called Writers Resist, he asked, what are you resisting, getting a real job? <laughs> but it's really an honor to be here with so many talented and committed writers, like anyone who believes in decency, in fairness, in democracy, in religious, racial, economic, and gender equality, hell, like anyone who believes in facts. 
I am horrified by the election of Donald Trump, horrified by his brutal politics, by his barrel of loon cam uh, cabinet, and most of all by the damage four years of Trumpism could do to the planet, to civil rights, to history. So I struggled to find a single reading that captured all of this outrage and fear and also showed the determination to stand up and fight. I suppose I'm a satirist at heart, and I've been worried that Trump might actually be too stupid to satirize. <laughs> In writing about Nazi Germany, Hannah Arendt first described the banality of evil, but no one warned us about its sheer stupidity. But I think there will pl be plenty of room in the next four years for satire, as there will be for realist fiction and allegory and poetry and nonfiction and memoir. And if I may, I'd like to make a plug for my old profession, journalism. The attacks on journalists by this petulant and bullying toddler-in-chief <laughs> are unprecedented. And our dissident writers in the next four years might be Jake Tapper, Maggie Haberman, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Megan Kelly. <laughs> Poems, short stories, and essays might mean very little without a free press on the front lines of the battle for intellectual honesty and freedom. But as many of the readings tonight show, these challenges are not unprecedented, and we find solace in other fights against authoritarian attacks on civil rights and decency. I find myself going back to Albert Camus and his great essay, Create Dangerously, from Resistance, Rebellion, and Death, in which he urged artists to create with courage and boldness in the face of the sort of tyranny faced in the last century. I like Camus' essay because it reminds us that it is both a duty and an honor to stand up to tyrants. Let us rejoice, Camus wrote, at being faced with cruel truths. Let us rejoice because a prolonged hoax has collapsed and we see clearly what threatens us. And let us rejoice as artists, torn from our sleep and from our deafness, forced to keep our eyes on destitution, prisons, and bloodshed. If faced with such a vision, we can preserve the memory of days and of faces, and if, conversely, faced with the world's beauty, we manage not to forget the humiliated, then Western art will gradually recover its strength. But the time of irresponsible artists is over. We, re we shall regret it for our little moments of bliss, but we shall accept the challenge. The freedom of art is not worth much when its only purpose is to assure the artist's comfort. One may long, as I do, for a gentler flame, a pause for musing, but perhaps there is no peace for the artist in the heat of combat. Great ideas, it has been said, come into the world as gently as doves. Perhaps then, if we listen, we shall hear amid the uproar a faint fluttering, the gentle stirring of life and hope. Some will say this hope lies in a nation, others in a man. I believe rather it is, a, it is awakened, revised, nourished by millions of solitary individuals whose deeds and works every day negate frontiers and the crudest implications of history. As a result, there shines forth fleetingly the ever-threatened truth that each and every man and woman on the foundation of his and her own sufferings and joy builds for us all. But you don't have to go back that far to find writers responding to these challenges. I found myself thinking a lot recently of the title of Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s A Man Without a Country, and was reminded when I read it how the seeds of Trumpism were sown in the 2000 election. Our leaders are sick of all the solid information that has been dumped on humanity by research and scholarship and investigative reporting, Vonnegut wrote. In case you haven't noticed, as the result of a shamelessly rigged election in which thousands of African Americans were arbitrarily disenfranchised, we now present ourselves to the rest of the world as proud, grinning, jut-jawed, pitiless war lovers. In case you haven't noticed, we are now as feared and hated all over the world as the Nazis once were. In case you haven't noticed, our unelected leaders have dehumanized millions and millions of human beings simply because of their religion and race. So I am a man without a country. 
What can be said to our young people now that this psychopath, now that psychopathic personalities, that is to say, persons without conscience, without senses of pity or shame, have taken all the money in the treasuries of our government and corporations and made it their own? That question hangs at the end of Vonnegut's essay, but just the other day I read what might be an answer to all of us at the end of a New Yorker essay, essay by the great Chimamande Ngozi Adichie, who wrote, now is the time to counter lies with facts while also proclaiming the greater truths of our equal humanity, of decency, of compassion. Every precious ideal must be reiterated, every obvious argument made, because an ugly idea left unchallenged begins to turn the color of normal. It does not have to be like this. Thank you. Next is G. Willow Wilson. Uh, hello. So I would like to read to you today a short excerpt from an essay by the wonderful late Italian novelist and linguist Umberto Eco, in which he reflects on his childhood in Italy, living under fascism in the era of World War II. And it is so eerily prescient that it almost needs no captioning at all on my part. It's called Urfascism. In my country today, there are people who are wondering if the resistance had a real military impact on the course of the war. For my generation, this question is irrelevant. We immediately understood the moral and psychological meaning of the resistance. For us, it was a point of pride to know that we Europeans did not wait passively for liberation. And for the young Americans who were paying with their blood for our restored freedom, it meant something to know that behind the firing lines, there were Europeans paying their own debt in advance. In my country today, there are some who say the War of Liberation was a tragic period of division and that all we need is national reconciliation. The memory of those terrible years should be repressed. If reconciliation means compassion and respect for all those who fought their own war in good faith to forgive does not mean to forget. I can say that Eichmann sincerely believed in his mission, but I cannot say, okay, come back and do it again. We are here to remember what happened and solemnly say that they must never do it again. But who are they? If we still think of the totalitarian governments that ruled Europe before the Second World War, we can easily say that it would be difficult for them to reappear in the same form in different historical circumstances. Nevertheless, even though political regimes can be overthrown and ideologies can be criticized and disowned, behind a regime and its ideology, there is always a way of thinking and feeling, a group of cultural habits, of obscure instincts and unfathomable drives. Is there still another ghost stalking Europe? not to speak of other parts of the world. In spite of this fuzziness, I think it is possible to outline a list of features that are typical of what I would like to call Ur-fascism or eternal fascism. These features cannot be organized into a system. Many of them contradict each other and are also typical of other kinds of despotism or fanaticism. But it is enough that one of them be present to allow fascism to coagulate around it. One, the first feature of Ur-fascism is the cult of tradition. Traditionalism is, of course, much older than fascism. It is a belief that each of the original messages of a tradition contain a sliver of wisdom, and whenever they seem to say different or incompatible things, it is only because all are alluding allegorically to the same primeval truth. As a consequence, there can be no advancement of learning. Truth has already been spelled out once and for all, and we need only keep interpreting its obscure message. Two, traditionalism implies the rejection of modernism. The Enlightenment, the age of reason, is seen as the beginning of modern depravity. 
In this sense, Urufascism can be defined as irrationalism. Three, irrationalism also depends on the cult of action for action's sake. Action being beautiful in itself, it must be taken before or without any previous reflection. Thinking is a form of emasculation. <laughs> Therefore, culture is suspect insofar as it is identified with critical attitudes. Distrust of the intellectual world has always been a symptom of Urufascism. Four, no syncretic faith can withstand analytical criticism. The critical spirit makes distinctions, and to distinguish is a sign of modernism. In modern culture, the scientific community praises disagreement as a way to improve knowledge. For Urufascism, disagreement is treason. Five, besides, disagreement is a sign of diversity. Urufascism grows up and seeks for consensus by exploiting and exacerbating the natural fear of difference. The first appeal of a fascist or prema prematurely fascist movement is an appeal against intruders. Thus, Urufascism is racist by definition. Six, Urufascism derives from individual or social frustration. This is why one of the most typical features of the historical fascism was the appeal to a frustrated middle class, a class suffering from an economic crisis or feelings of political humiliation and frightened by the pressure of other social groups. In our time, when the old proletarians are becoming the petty bourgeoisie, the fascism of tomorrow will find its audience in this new majority. We must keep alert so that the sense of these words will not be forgotten again. Or fascism is still around us, sometimes in plain clothes. It would be so much easier for us if they appeared on the world scene somebody saying, I want to reopen Auschwitz. I want the black shirts to parade again in the Italian squares. Life is not that simple. Or fascism can come back under the most innocent of disguises. Our duty is to uncover it and to point our finger at any of its new instances every day in every part of the world. Franklin Roosevelt's words of November 4th, 1938 are worth recalling. I venture the challenging statement that if American democracy ceases to move forward as a living force, seeking day and night by peaceful means to better the lot of our citizens, fascism will grow in strength in our land. Freedom and liberation are an unending task. Thank you. Our final reader tonight is Daniel James Brown. So I, um, I thought about uh, reading a passage from my own book, uh, The Boys in the Boat, uh, this evening. And so I looked through uh, the book, and I was kind of horrified to find how much um, of that book had suddenly become relevant uh, again since uh, November 9th. Um, but I wanted to read something uh, more uplifting, I think. And so, particularly since this is Martin Luther King's uh, birthday, I decided um, to go with him. Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail was written on April 16th, 1963, in response to eight white Alabama clergymen who had labeled him an outside agitator for coming to Birmingham. And it is, to my mind, the greatest persuasive essay in the history of American letters. He wrote it in the margins of newspapers, the only paper that he was given in his jail cell. Tomorrow night, I understand there's going to be a whole evening devoted to the letter, and it's well worth that. I used to teach it when I was a writing teacher. Um, I'm going to read just a few short excerpts this evening. I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned 
about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutually of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow provincial notion of outside agitator. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider. We have waited for more than 340 years for our God-given and constitutional rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward the goal of political independence, and we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward the gaining of a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. I guess it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mother and father at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, brutalize, and even kill your black brothers and sisters with impunity, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on the television and see tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son asking in agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you, when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger and your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and when your wife and mother are never given the respected title of Mrs., when you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we fight why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into an abyss of injustice where they experience the bleakness of corroding despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are presently misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, 
the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred knowledge and heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. As you know, the ACLU is here. Many representatives are in the lobby. They would love to talk to you about what you might do to support civil rights uh, and civil liberties. The bar will be open. There's coffee as well. Um, thank you for being here. It seems to me that together we can uh, do something to resist despair, to resist silence, and to resist uh, erosion of American values. Thank you for coming.